area of, of expanding cycle capacity. Uh, currently, we started a, a couple of years ago with a, a Burrard Bridge trial, which we closed down a lane of traffic on the Burrard Bridge and gave it over to bikes. And since then, we've been uh, moving very quickly to add additional separated bike lanes. Basically, this is our bike lane system for the city, but the vast majority of that is on either shared streets uh, or in bike lanes uh, that are unseparated. And we know from our experiences in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, etc., that you never get really a, a, a significant improvement in your bike share, particularly in the context of the 8 to 80 goal, where people from 8 years old to 80 years old will, will bike as opposed to the 20 to 35 kamikaze bike riders males usually, primarily, that tend to be the mainstay of the 2-4% to 4 percent, um, uh, bike share that we have across North America. So if you want to get it to, to people where people can, can ride in their business suits or in their high heel shoes and kids can ride and seniors can ride, the key to it is separated bike lanes. And we know that, so that's why we're doing so much work aggressively in that area right now. We managed to avoid the, the war on the car narrative that we, we see with, with great sadness going on in cities like Toronto right now. But it's still tense, and particularly with the business community, uh, quite concerned about the loss of, of, of lanes. We try to make the idea of, um, of bike culture ubiquitous in our public realm, the idea that it's a, it's a free part of our, of our public realm where you don't see signs that say no bikes allowed. And even uh, uh, putting it into our culture so much that you, you can start to think of biking as a part of everyday life. And as I was giving a talk to a, uh, a group of international urbanists on, on a bike tour, a bike wedding went by, and people, oh, remember that, that, that was me at this point. Uh, and uh, they, the, the organizers thought I had staged that, and I said I didn't have that kind of power. But it, so, it shows that you once you get to a certain point where bike culture is ubiquitous, you start to see an awful lot of interesting things happening in the public realm. We plan a lot for transit, where we're as engaged and excited about TOD, transit-oriented design, as, ever, as anyone, but we always remind people that it's our third priority in Vancouver, not our first. And we, we start with that recognition that every transit trip starts and ends with your feet. We even use uh, water as part of our transit system, of course. Uh, that's movement and land use. Next, there's the concept of, uh, of design quality. We say that uh, everything we do in terms of resiliency and such, in, in terms of attracting people to live in the downtown area rather than choose less resilient, less suburban choices, is about consistent quality of design, and particularly a high quality of the public realm. We start off taking full advantage of our waterfront, making sure, for example, as a constant rule, that all water edge uh, is public in the city. Uh, we don't get. We try to avoid the debate about whether tall buildings are good or bad. We see tall buildings as a design challenge. So when we allow tall buildings in our downtown, we separate them for, for sunlight access and for privacy and, and preventing shadow impacts. We put a human scale at the podium. Uh, we make them walkable. We make them mixed. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the, the human scale podium allows us to get that young Gale kind of hu human uh, uh, level mixed use uh, and activation of the street. And then the towers are stepped back, separated, and float out of, out of the perception of the walker. So we managed to avoid this debate about whether mid rise or high rise is the best. In our best moments, we've, we've become the model for how you would mix them over the year before. We integrate art, public art, throughout the public realm, and even the concept of civic art, the idea that you take all of your infrastructure and make it an art form as well. An old concept from the early 20th century that we lost in the 20th century, but certainly many cities are trying to bring back. And the third component of density done well is the concept of amenities. High density without amenities can be awfully unlivable, so we use our amenities to achieve everything from obviously a, a, a augmenting of our beaches, our natural environment, but the, the quality of the public realm at the water edge. Uh, we achieve parks through development, public squares and other public spaces through development. And just about anything you can imagine we've achieved in the Vancouver model, from heritage preservation, from civic uh, facilities, cultural facilities, uh, uh, daycare, uh, school sites, etc. We've leveraged, leveraged in a way that no other city does in North America through uh, the success of the private sector marketplace, if you will. And it's a, a model that makes many developers nervous when I talk about it outside of Vancouver, but it's been a very key um, uh, aspect of, of the Vancouver achievement of high density market, uh, markets, very strong market, uh, highly livable development. This is a sense of the kind of transformation you can have across as short a time as 20 years. 
Um, this is a, this about matches the time frame of my career so far. I've been a planner for about 19 years, and it shows that uh, for better or for worse, you can transform your city significantly within a 20-year time span. I'm actually working on updating that from 2003 because it's already quite a bit out to date. What it shows is you can, if you've got the right value set, the right principles, the right regulations in place, you can do either a very good transformation or you can really mess up your city within the concept of 20 years. All the answer being based on how how uh, you, how strongly you've uh, uh, written down and adhered to your principles. And as I said earlier, a key success in our downtown was in the area of attracting kids. 7,000 more kids in our downtown peninsula. Two school, uh, one school, elementary school opening, another set to open. The only two that I know of in downtown, uh, in downtowns in North America. All by plan, all by regulation, not by accident, and not by hoping and pushing. So let's take a quick look at the rest of the uh, city. Um, resilience is an awful lot about building form, and one of the things we frequently discuss and talk about is whether our podium and point tower uh, form is an inherently adaptable form over time, and I think there's certainly big challenges and questions associated with that. But across the rest of the city, we're seeing a lot of forms, we're, well, we're not seeing, we're planning a lot of forms that really move us away from the high rise in every context, and, and particularly in, in the area of uh, more adaptable mid rise form, which we're very pleased about. Some of our great models, like our Butis Walk and Collingwood Village, which was our Mark I first generation transit-oriented development on, on SkyTrain. And uh, uh, we're learning from those to, to work on a number of what we call major projects in other contexts around the city. And you see largely, mostly mid-rise. Uh, there's still a huge debate in Vancouver about whether high-rises at all, or even in the right uh, key strategic places, should be a big part of the Vancouver model. Certainly, I've said that the, um, that the majority of the future of the rest of the city in Vancouver will be about mid-rise and other forms, and, and only selected places to do high-rises on the side of the downtown. Uh, in that rest of the city, we were planning what we call our neighborhood centers approach, which is, which is about uh, uh, essentially binding our neighborhoods together with community hearts uh, in, in the context of, of uh, various community plans across the city. So we're gradually working on, on establishing all those neighborhood center policies in place. It's all in keeping with this idea, or all of our work these days are, is in keeping with the idea that unlike North, most North American cities that are frankly still struggling with the relationship between land use and transportation, the relationship with the planning department and the engineering department, for example. And I'd, I'd say that many um, municipalities are still fundamentally not there yet. We've been there on that relationship for a couple of decades, I think, and, and, and we fight every day to maintain that relationship. But at the same time, we're adding the energy dimension. And frankly, I could add a new circle there on food as well really integrating all of these uh, into a, a much more progressive and sophisticated urban form model. But energy, and how energy is used, generated, and distributed is going to be as important an issue as transportation and mobility has been over the last few years, particularly as we move to more and more uh, ideas that are renewable energy based and off the grid. Food uh, is a key issue, and, and at best right now we're making some pretty significant baby steps, but we want to do something much more aggressive in the area of food policy, food security, integration of food into the public ground, food production into the public ground, uh, food availability in the form of farmers markets and community markets throughout the city, uh, not only as a strong component to social resilience, it's a way of bringing communities and people together, but particularly recognizing the huge carbon footprints associated with with getting food to the table. Uh, in the public realm sense, we think about social resiliency in terms of the activation of the public realm. We've had a reputation in Vancouver of being a bit of a no-fun city, uh, but as you can see in the last, oh, 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 oh. Uh, in the bottom slide, um, uh, if we close down the streets for an average Saturday, we can get a pretty good crack. I'm actually lying, that's the gold medal game. Uh, we don't usually get that. That comes right after the gold medal game. We don't usually get those kind of crowds, but we do think that, uh, that the Olympics changed forever the way that Vancouver sees the public realm. And certainly he sees uh, Granville Street, which is that particular street. By the way, if you weren't in Vancouver during the Olympics, you missed a really good time. Uh, even in the context of closing down streets on a regular basis, we've been doing pilot projects throughout the summer on what we call the Summer Spaces uh, uh, program, which is closing down commercial streets and just trying things. Pilots about everything from laying down uh, uh, fake grass to other uh, things like uh, uh, um, dance lessons and what have you.